Uh, thanks very much, John. And uh, I, I'm speaking here, I, th I would say, as an insider rather than as a guest, given the work that we're doing here in the last uh, 24 months, probably, and more intensely in the immediate future. So this is a great occasion. Uh, my website is michaelfullen.ca, and I'm now thinking that CA is bilingual, CA for Canada, CA for California. I expect dual citizenship soon. I think I'm almost qualified for that. But it's also a fantastic time right now for California. California is the most interesting, provocative living laboratory for whole system change that we've been working on. And we always work from practice to research, not the other way around. So this is always grounded in partnerships with activities. And I wrote a blog earlier this year that said there's something different in 2014, something different that uh, is happening, the combination of push factors, things that we know don't work, and pull factors, things that are really uh, 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 have great promise and, and some proven track record. So it's very, the mix uh, is very different in 2014, and there's nowhere on the planet, and I am a lot around the planet a lot, where this applies more than California. Uh, this is, uh, and the number of elements, and for people like me who work on whole system change, there couldn't be a greater challenge than California with all of the pieces and combinations. And what's happening here is akin to a movement. It's not a large-scale change detailed plan, but it is a movement. And in a movement, you have a lot of the parties, and I, I don't want to take up half of my 20 minutes by naming the ones that we're connected to, the ones that are sitting in this room. A lot of parties that are in a movement moving in the same direction. Uh, when it's complicated and when it's a movement, you do not want too much coordination at the beginning. Uh, nor can you get it, actually. Uh, that the coordination will narrow things down. The, la the, the, the kind of looseness of the beginning, the pieces of it, is an advantage because innovations and combinations can be created through the process, and that eventually, sooner than later, you start to get some coherence and some focus and some detail. But a good thing about a movement, it is in the same direction. So inevitably, these things will, uh, these things will connect. At times like this, I also uh, like to refer to uh, Seamus Haney, the, the poet, the Irish poet who died uh, last August 30th. And I'll just read the first half of his poem, which is so poignant for, in its own right, and for the situation that I see before us. And it goes like this. It's called The Cure of Troy. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up, and here's the punchline, and hope in history rhyme. Hope in history rhyme. Now, I don't uh, know that tidal wave is the right metaphor for you in California, uh, but definitely hope and history are rhyming in this kind of unusual combination of circumstances. So uh, I do want to emphasize again that our team, there's about 10 or 12 of us, Andy Hargraves, myself, uh, also some people that are uh, based here. Uh, we have worked very closely with the Stewart Foundation uh, over the last couple of years, uh, well, also with the new grant. I see uh, Davis Campbell there, who has been also, I've worked with for a number of years. He has his finger in so many pies that I'm, I'm surprised he hasn't been arrested yet, uh, that, uh, that he, he does have a lot of uh, good fingers at work. And I want to take this, and I wouldn't normally do this, but take this occasion to recognize the president of the Stewart Foundation, uh, Christy Pitchell, who, is, uh, who will be leaving in, uh, in June, and the work that she's done behind the scenes to shape with a small leverage but a powerful impact. So Christy, I, I want to personally thank you for your support for all of us in this room, but especially for our work as well. Thank you. So I'd like, I, I, I wish I could uh, spend time talking about the projects, but we will, we will, we are connecting to a lot of you and I will increasingly connect with uh, Linda and with David and others, the State Department, the governors, the AXA, the, the Parents Association, the California Forward. There's a lot of uh, pieces here, but not, uh, not an overwhelming number, but numbers that appear now to want to move in the same direction. So let me, I, I've uh, 
I have about a dozen slides. These are available. Uh, I call it accountability that sticks. It's a preposition away, but, a, but a, a lifetime away from accountability with sticks, if you get the, uh, the drift of it. So accountability that sticks, and maybe I can best uh, describe what it is uh, by, uh, by an actual example that captures the, the essence of this. In, um, we work a lot around the world, different jurisdictions. Uh, the themes are the same, the starting points are different. One of the places we worked was ACT, the Australian Capital Territories in uh, Australia. And we were working in this system, 80 schools, uh, we moved forward, that's not my point here. One of the schools, a secondary school, when we were first there, had just introduced coaching. They trained a couple of teachers for peer coaching, uh, classroom observation and feedback. And the, uh, quite a few teachers in the school uh, were uh, wary of it. They didn't want p people coming into their room, observing them and giving them feedback on teaching. So there's a lot of uneasiness. Uh, two or three years later, we came back. We're doing filming, which we often do, of some of the work that is in order to get the specificity of it. And we observed in this school, this uh, high school, that everybody was doing coaching. They were all participating. They loved it. They were getting results. Uh, quite a phenomenon when one thinks of the starting point. And then I asked, the, at the end of the day, uh, I asked the deputy principal, I said, this is quite impressive. Is this practice of coaching, since everyone's involved, I said, is it voluntary or mandatory? And without hesitation, he said, it's voluntary but inevitable. Right? Think about that. A high quality change process is voluntary but inevitable, and with it comes accountability built in, what Richard Elmore called internal accountability. So there, you can get 95% of the accountability by having the quality change process that I've described. So let's take a look at some of these. Uh, uh, John mentioned the right and wrong drivers. You can look up this paper, Choosing the Right and Wrong Drivers. I won't dwell on them, but this frames it. Uh, the, the wrong drivers that people have pursued. Drivers are policies intended to get results. Wrong drivers are policies that don't work. In fact, these actually backfire. Why do politicians pursue wrong drivers? I'd say because they can, because they're in for a quick fix, because they can make uh, to appeal to the public superficially. But thankfully, and, and this is the opportunity we have before us now, is that the, the decision makers, the key policy makers, the key constituencies in this room are, are rejecting the wrong drivers as the basis of reform. So negative accountability, individualism, which is a subtle wrong driver, uh, technology, uh, as, uh, as ad, uh, ad hoc strategies. And we built our, our um, analysis, our action around the right drivers, capacity building, although these days we tend to think of professional capital as more elaborate than capacity building, collaborative work inside the school, across schools, uh, pedagogy as the drivers, the foundation technology as a reinforcer, and an odd term systemness, which is the degree to which people are aware that they're part of a bigger picture even though that bigger picture might be locally. And the strategy that I won't elaborate on, but we are pursuing here with you, and all of these, uh, all of these examples are led internally to this state. We happen to be facilitating and stimulating it, but we call the strategy uh, leadership from the middle. The middle are districts. The, the middle are combinations of districts, networks of districts. And, and the question is, where does the glue come when you have a big amorphous system. You can't get it by driving it from the center, we know that. You can't get it also by uh, local autonomy only. Schools left on their own in school autonomy will not thrive and the system will not thrive. They have to be connected, uh, some degrees of uh, collaboration uh, at, that, at that level. So leadership from the middle is to try to get some of this glue uh, within the districts, across districts, and then uh, with, as part and parcel of that, be very strong two-way partners with local schools and communities on the one hand and the state uh, elaboration on the other hand. So this, uh, what I wanted to do, and I've put this list together uh, specifically just for today, thinking of uh, accountability itself, uh, here are some of the elements that I think that, uh, that, are re that make accountability stick. Uh, the example I gave from Canberra, that, that uh, policy, that practice of executive coaching, because of the nature of the process, will stick. It will stay and it will be, uh, it, it's embraced by people, it's internalized, it's got multiple reinforcing 
uh, factors that will keep it, uh, in, in, that's what I mean by sticking, the conditions under which good practice will keep going and being elaborated. So here is the combination, ongoing feedback to, uh, as a fundamental premise, uh, relative to standards, but really feedback itself. So the biggest factor in relation to teaching that most policies get wrong is to try to make uh, 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 feedback in your face in a way that counter is counterproductive. But nonetheless, one way or the other, ongoing feedback is key to this. Secondly, transparency of practice and results is vital. Uh, third, predominant mode is growth. If you have growth plus transparency, you have a good combination. If you have transparency plus negative accountability, fireworks. So this, this, these are interacting. Lead with social decisional capital. Uh, well, uh, LPC, I defined at the bottom, is local professional capital. I'll mention what we mean by professional capital, the three dimensions. But lead with social decisional capital rather than individualistic uh, uh, effort. And this is the bedrock of performance and the bedrock of accountability. Uh, make LCAP about capacity building action oriented. When you look at, and John mentioned at this beginning, the local uh, control funding formula and the LCAP accountability and combination, as he said, this opens the door in our, in our experience. This points in the right direction, but it's not sufficient. And what could go wrong with LCAP when I think about it, and this is where it has to be a vehicle of, uh, of, of development, uh, what could go wrong is it could become a bureaucratic requirement. You, you have to uh, send in your LCAP plans because you have to send them in, so people go through uh, the motions. But even if they do the democratic process and consult with all kinds of people, if they end up with a plan where there's a lot of consultation and a general agreement of the direction, but not much specific strategy and specific capacity building opportunities, it will fail. So a big question mark is how to make LCAP a capacity vehicle uh, that's local, regional and statewide. Uh, participate in purposeful networks. This is our leadership from the middle, whether those are networks across schools, within a district, but preferably across districts. Uh, intervene selectively. Uh, uh, Linda, I'm sure, will talk more about this under, under the broad accountability framework. Explicitly design the broader accountability framework, the one, for example, that Linda Darling Hammond is working on that we're connecting to, is in a way that supports the above seven. And this local uh, LPC, I mean local professional capital. So the, the, the accountability uh, frame of this is really three pieces, I'm going to say. And it turns traditional accountability on its head. Piece number one is the foundation, which is local professional capacity within the district, minimum size the district, preferably combination of districts. So that's where you want to have the, the strength of accountability, the strength of performance is there. That's foundation number one. Number two then is a broader accountability framework that, co that uh, is uh, supportive and stimulates the development of that. And number three then is to intervene selectively instead of the other way around, which intervention is the top starting point you want to make an intervention to be uh, the uh, kind of uh, a part that reinforces it. The CCEE, if I could also uh, uh, end on this before I uh, finish in a few uh, key slides, uh, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, it's a bit of a mystery right now. Uh, what should it do? Where should it be placed? What's the relationship between the governor, the State Department, uh, the uh, uh, ACSA and others? So this is a um, this is a complicated uh, mechanism. I wouldn't say I, I count on it to save the day, but it would be nice if it was a strong, coordinating, stimulating effort along these principles. How can it be that way when there's a lot of tripping um, back and forth over what it should be? So I think that's a big question mark. Another question mark for me as an outsider is to figure out the role of the county offices in these equations. So there are complications here but there's also a direction and everybody is willing to move in the same, uh, as part of the same social movement. This is an agenda that favors parent and teacher alliance. This is an agenda that favors that alliance. So uh, what, let me give you a rhetorical, uh, I've loaded the deck here on this. What has a greater impact on teacher learning? Critical feedback, you remember, is the foundation of this. Teacher appraisal, What's its impact on learning? Professional development, what's its impact? Collaborative cultures. I've loaded the deck. Teacher appraisal, even if you get it right, 
which the federal government doesn't do. They actually have, there's a double whammy because they have the wrong driver individualism and compounded by the wrong driver negativism. So you've got a double, a, a double two of the four wrong drivers uh, teaming up to make sure it doesn't work. So if you look, think about this, uh, teacher appraisal, I, I don't mind it as part of the part, but it will never be intensive enough to be powerful. Professional development looks like it works. Professional development and learning, why wouldn't that work? Because professional development detached, or even if you try to connect it sometimes, it doesn't find its way into ongoing implementation. The only part that really is powerful is the collaborative culture, uh, because the collaborative culture stares you in the face every day when you're in that, in that school or in that network of schools. And, that, and so this, we're flipping this on its uh, head again. Collaborative cultures is the foundation. Reinforce it with selective professional development and teacher selective pre, uh, appraisal. Uh, this uh, professional capital, uh, human, social, and decisional, uh, we could uh, spend a lot of time on this. Basically, I want to say it simply, human capital is the quality of individuals, uh, the selection and nurturing of talent, uh, it turns out that human capital is important, but it's not the main starting point. The starting point for us, because it's powerful, is social capital. Social capital is the quality of the group. I could give you several studies that show this. When the group is strong, they get a lot more done because the group covers more territory than individual leaders do. They cover, peers cover the waterfront if they're purposeful. So we have a lot of examples, and the successful districts in this state, for example, are all good examples of combining human capital, social capital, the quality of the group. Again, the research is pretty clear here. The practice is pretty clear. And the decisional capital, which we don't normally think about, but that's the detailed decisions that people make about improvement of practice, about the use of data, the things I hope that Linda and David and others will talk about. It's there that we get with the 10,000 hours of getting more and more expert that you get more effective. So let me uh, end with uh, a couple of things about professional capital. It is about cultivating these three dimensions over a period of time and on a large scale. Uh, it is about principles as lead learner. The last book I just did was called The Principle Maximizing Impact, Three Keys. The keys are the principle as lead learner, not as running the show on a one-to-one -one basis, on instructional focus, but on inf influencing the group. Uh, explicit, uh, uh, indirect, but nonetheless explicit. And that's also mapped out in this book. Uh, models learning and shapes the conditions for all to learn. Uh, professional capital, here's what I want to end with. Uh, think about these observations, these ad hoc observations that are all reinforcing of what I said. Talented schools will improve a weak teacher. Talented teachers will leave a weak school. And here's an important one as well. Good collaboration reduces bad variation. Research finds time and again that variation in a practice within schools and across schools is quite high. Uh, within schools as well as across schools. Uh, and mostly we think of it the other way around, but if you think about it, uh, a bad variation is ineffective teaching. And what good collaboration does is that it reduces bad variation because it gravitates towards consistent good practice. That's what that does, and so we should rec recognize it. Networks of schools and districts are part of this solution. And then uh, finally, an another observation I would make about uh, uh, how teachers um, What's the role of teachers and how can they move into uh, uh, effective relationships? And I think this is the way I would position it. If you're in a bad relationship, you should rather be alone. I'm, I'm happily married, so I don't, I'm not thinking of myself. But if you're in a bad relationship, you should rather be alone. And that's why teachers have retreated to individualism and in, in autonomy, because they've been in a bad relationship uh, with the policy. If, but you shouldn't want to stay in a bad relationship, or you shouldn't want to stay alone, because being alone is not very effective, as well as not very healthy. So you should want to be in a good relationship. So I think the, uh, the chance right now, the opportunity, the, the risk to be taken on the part of teachers, is that you should want to be a degree, you would, should want to have degrees of autonomy from the hierarchy, and this is the policy direction in this state does provide that, but you should not want degrees of autonomy from each other, laterally, within the school, across the school. 
and that. And so this is a fantastic time, and this particular meeting, I think, is a marker in 2014 that the work now, right away, that's already been going on, that needs to be accelerated and deepened, is about coordinating these efforts and increasing the focus. And I once again want to say this will not be smoothly coordinated. But because the movement is in the same direction, you can count on the innovations, the aggravations to be worth it because that's, those are the things that will start, those are the things that will create the solutions and the impact. I am so excited to be part of this movement and so glad that we are going to be more and more connected and that we will, in the next two years plus, see fantastic results coming out of this state. Thank you very much.